Anyway, we're grateful to see you this morning. Good to be together as always. Oh, I encourage you to open your Bibles to Matthew 18, 15 to 17. We'll think from there this morning. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Bill Bajens and I have emailed back and forth this week and um, his wife Laura, they have found a mass behind her ear. Uh, they're at the brain and they think they're pretty positive. It's just a bundle of nerves that uh, has gone haywire for some reason. No cancer. Uh, they won't know that for a fact until they operate. And so I would ask you to keep Bill and Laura in your prayers. Uh, always, I'll be going to camp every day this week. Uh, in the mornings I teach down there from about 9 to 10. And uh, looking forward to being a part of that this year. The, they wanted me to come and stay all week, and I just, nah, not this year. Uh, we'll see about next year, though. When, when I was in college, we had big Valentine's Day banquets. That, that was one of the things that uh, the student government put on to try to raise some more money, and uh, there were about three or four of us guys in the dorms, and we'd always make sure we had dates and go and have a good time and all that. Well, one year... I took a girl I, I was very interested in, okay? And uh, Tammy knows who it is, by the way. And uh, took her and one of the professors, I forget exactly who it was, divided some of the married folks up and they were going to do our own version of the newlywed game. And so I, I don't remember if the guys went first, the gals, or, or how it transpired or who won any of that. But I can very vividly remember some of the answers that some gave. Very quickly, things turned out quite uh, risque, you might say. And here we single guys are with our dates and we're becoming more and more embarrassed by the minute. Eventually we leave. Well, we, it just it got too much. And one of my friends saw me in the hall on Monday morning. She hadn't gone to the banquet and she was a school cook and she asked me how things had gone. Well, I, I told everything. I spilled the beans. I, I named names. I gave answers. I, I did everything. Well, a little while later, Carolyn's working the kitchen and some things and someone else comes in and Carolyn's telling her about that night and guess who walks in the cafeteria about that time? The ringleader of that whole operation on Friday night. I, I'll call her Heather protect the guilty and innocent and uh, she was, Heather was hurt, she was embarrassed, she was humiliated and so I'm in class. We get out for break and I'm going to the cafeteria with a horde of others and Heather steps out of her office and said, Justin, we need to talk. She reminded me of the scripture we're going to read this morning about how I should have gone to her and she would have been more than happy to apologize and you know, what could I do but apologize? She, she was right and I was wrong and uh, I hope I learned a lesson then. I, I don't know that I have. I've done the same thing a few times and I'm sure you have too. Spoken out of turn about people that you ought not have spoken out of turn about. Maybe word got back to you and maybe it didn't. Maybe word got back to that individual and maybe it didn't. Maybe we've been on the receiving end of gossip and people have told things that we've done out of turn and in front of others and we ended up being embarrassed. Jesus talks about that this morning in our text. The Lord, because He created us and made us, knew that, that family is messy, if you will. Church can be messy. You know, when you're living in close proximity to people, sometimes feathers get ruffled and people get hurt. And Jesus says in Luke 17, 1, that it is impossible for offenses not to come. We understand that. We're going to be offended at times. It's not possible that no offenses could come. So if that's the case, if it's impossible for offenses not to come, how do we handle it? How do we deal with it? Well, Jesus in Matthew 18, 15 to 17 answers that question for us. And what the Lord says is this, that Christians seek reconciliation. Christians, people of God, seek reconciliation. That makes sense. 
God has reconciled the world to himself through Jesus. And we as Christians are about reconciliation. We've been reconciled to God through the blood, through the death of Jesus. And therefore we're to be reconciled to one another when that need arises. Let's go to Matthew 18 to learn what the Lord would have us to know. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. And notice what Jesus says here. If your brother has sinned against you. He uses the word sin here in the text. Same word you find for sin elsewhere in Scripture to speak of our rebellion against God. It's if your brother sins against you. He uses the word offense over in Luke 17.1. That idea is a stumbling block, a, a minor thing. Here, I think Jesus elevates it a little bit. Not just an offense. Not just having feathers slightly ruffled. It is sin. It is sin against you. You know that we're going to be offended at times. You know, it may be that, that you come into church one time and someone is sitting in your pew. You know, I mean, you've got your name on it and everything else, but there sits so-and-so. Maybe someone forgets to sign your birthday card out there in the foyer. I've been guilty of that a time or two myself. You, you, you know, you forget things sometimes and you get a little offended. I really don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's elevating it. It's if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That was the teaching of the rabbis, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and others in the day of Jesus. It was considered sinful to go and rebuke someone in public. You, you just did not do that. You handled things privately. Why is that? Why is it best to handle those things privately? I think there are a lot of reasons. One, I think it goes back to the golden rule. You know what I mean? I mean, if I've offended you, I don't want everybody and his cousin and brother and everybody knowing about it. There is some decency about the individual there, I think, and it is you go to him, him alone. I think, too, the idea is that, you know, sometimes we don't know that we've done wrong and that rebuke needs to be private, that work things out between us. And, you know, when you go and tell other people, it, it can get messy and a tangled web and everything else. And, you know, maybe I need to apologize to you, but I've got to go apologize to your brother because he now is angry and over here to... No. Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, Jesus says, you've gained your brother. Uh, that's the whole idea of this. It's not to show how right you are and how wrong the other person is. It's not that at all. It is seeking reconciliation. It's to be one because we are one in Jesus. That's the idea. Verse 16. If he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Jesus knows we can be stubborn, we can be obstinate, we can be people who don't listen to counsel and rebuke. He made us. He's going to know those things. And he says, if he will not hear you, take two or three others, that by the mouths of two or three witnesses every word may be established. The idea of two or three witnesses comes from Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. There, if you were to bring an accusation against someone under the law, you had to have two or three witnesses. Let me tell you how seriously rabbis took that principle. Okay, I walk in on you murdering someone, and you have a bloody knife in your hand? I can't do a thing. You would get off scot-free unless I had another witness. You had to have two or three witnesses, even for murder, 
for everything. Bloody knife, blood on your clothes, all the evidence there. Uh Uh-uh. Not good enough. You have to have two or three witnesses. And Jesus institutes that principle here to have two or three witnesses. Now, in this passage, I don't think that the two or three witnesses are to witness the sin. I, I don't think that's the idea, really. It seems that they're to witness before the church at large that a private rebuke took place. I I think that's their purpose. Because Jesus makes clear in the next verse, verse 17, that there is that rebuke. It's going a step further. And I think they're to take that back to the church and say, he or she refuses to repent. Verse 17. If he refuses to hear them, Tell it to the church. But if, if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. If he refuses to hear them, the witnesses. And, and so I think they're encouraging that rebuke and, and encouraging repentance and to make things right with others and before God. But he says, if he refuses to hear the church... Let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Jesus doesn't tell us here how the church is to take care of this matter. He he just leaves it up, I believe, to us, specifically to the elders of the local church, to determine how that's to be done. The Lord does that in in several ways. He tells us we're to do certain things, but doesn't tell us exactly how we have to do it. Those things, I I believe, are within uh, the domain of the elders, if you will, to decide in certain places, here's how we'll handle that. But if he refuses to hear the church, so there's another rebuke to take place. There's been three rebukes now. A private rebuke, call for repentance, one with two or three witnesses, and then one from the church. But if he refuses to hear the church, let him beat you like a heathen and a tax collector. In the synagogue, there were different levels of discipline. You could be beaten. I mean, if you really violate synagogue principles and Jewish law, they would beat you as punishment, as discipline. But the most severe discipline was, we might say, disfellowship, excommunication, kicking him out of the community. Now, imagine what that would have been like in the day of Jesus. You are in a Jewish village. You have a shop there. Your kids are are being educated there at the synagogue. You have your parents and your spouse. And all of a sudden, all that dries up. No one will speak to you because you've been cast out of the synagogue. Your wife won't fix your dinner because you've been kicked out of the synagogue. Your parents can't speak to you. You've been kicked out of the synagogue. Do you see why that would urge repentance and encourage people to get things right with God? It was big time, major step to be kicked out of the synagogue. Horrible. But it happened to bring people back to the Lord. Why does Jesus tell us to treat people as a heathen and a tax collector? Why treat them as though they're not a part of the body of Christ? Why cut them off? Why cast them out? I think there are two reasons for that. Paul gives them over in 1 Corinthians 5. The first is that individual may be saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, hear me now. Disfellowship, removing someone from the assembly, removing someone from the church is the supreme act of love a church can show. It is. Taking discipline that far is a great act of love and mercy. Why? Because the purpose of that is to help them see their error and bring them back to the Lord. That's the purpose. Here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 4. Back up to verse 3. I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who is 
so done, this deed, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So reason one to exercise that discipline is to see people's souls saved on the day of the Lord Jesus. That is the purpose. That's the idea. It's not that we don't love you. It's not that we don't want fellowship with you. It's that you're too precious to allow to go to hell. Second reason you have to keep discipline, and discipline is important, is at verse 8. Let us keep or, or go up to verse 6. Your glory is not good. Do you not know the little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven nor with a leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. If churches turn a blind eye to sin, you will encourage others to live lives of sin. It will allow sin to permeate the body of Christ. You see this principle with your own kids, okay? You know, one son comes to you and asks, Daddy, can I, I do whatever or can we do this? I say, okay. You know what the next one's going to do? Do the same thing. If you don't stay on top and consistent, you're going to have problems. I think that goes with the church as well. People say, well, so-and-so got by with adultery or so-and-so got by with this. and Why can't I? It's to purge that leaven from us. Because it will leaven the whole lump. And Jesus says, If he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a tax collector and a heathen. The whole purpose is reconciliation. The whole purpose is to reconcile people, one, to God, primarily to God, through Jesus Christ. And second, to reconcile ourselves to one another. We are one body. We are one people. And we need to keep that unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So, how practically do we take this principle? We need to speak to two groups this morning. We'll think of two ways we take and apply this text. First, we want to speak to those who have been wronged. We've all been there. We've all had people do us wrong in one way or another. We've all even had members of the church, brethren in Christ, do us wrong. If so, how do we act? One, I think you need to determine if you've really been wronged. Now, here's what I mean by this. I, I, I'm not denying that there are real offenses, that there are real problems, there are real sins against people. Not at all. Been there, done that, seen it. All of that. What I'm saying is sometimes I do think that some of our sensibilities are, 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 are too heightened. Sometimes we, we get our feathers ruffled when really the problem's with us and not with the other person. And, and we need to think have we really been wronged? Does the wrong rise to the level of sin? If it's sin, if it puts someone's soul in jeopardy, you have no choice, I think, but to handle it this way. Less than that, you've really been wronged, go ahead and handle it. Okay, I, I'm not saying don't do that when you've been wronged. But sometimes, I, I, we just need to be careful and make sure that we're not the ones being too sensitive. Maybe it would be better to accept the wrong if it's a little thing. Paul, right in different context, 1 Corinthians 6, 7 why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourself be cheated? Speaking about members of that congregation taking other members of that congregation to court. And, and, and Paul says, just, just quit. Accept the wrong. Although I believe what Jesus says here would very much go into effect there. Where they even take it to the church and allow the church to decide such cases. That's what Paul urges in that text. As long as it doesn't put the souls in jeopardy. 
maybe sometimes we accept the wrong. Depends on what it is, of course. But second, you never gossip. You never gossip. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. Is if I have a problem with you, I come to you. I, I, I don't go to the elders. Or I don't go to uh, Jim Bob over here and start telling him all how horrible you are. We don't do that. We don't gossip. Gossip brings much hurt and problems that we do not need. Throughout Scripture, gossip is condemned. I, I know Danny just finished up a class about gossip. And you know that gossip is not permitted among those who are the people of God. Proverbs 11.13 A tellbearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. Okay, some people say, you know, it's not gossip if it's true. I've heard that. You probably have too. Notice what the, Solomon says here. He who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter, even if it's true. He conceals it and he keeps it from the public eye. You handle it privately. Proverbs 17.9 He who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. I've seen that in the church too often. People gossip about so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and, -so and pretty soon you know that their friendships are harmed. There are people that don't speak anymore because someone ran his mouth or her mouth. We don't do that. We're the people of God. Three, you need to love the wrongdoer. You need to love the wrongdoer. I was told some time ago that God saying to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, strength was just morally wrong of God because you can't command love. It's an emotion. You know better than that. Love is not an emotion. Those of us who are married understand that. Some days you don't like the person you're married to but you still love him or her. You know what I mean. Love is action. Love is how we act. Love is the way we handle ourselves, carry ourselves. That is what love is. You go to 1 Corinthians 13, you don't find emotion there at all. You find action. That's what love is. And let me tell you something. If you have been wronged, going to the person and straightening out is a supreme act of love. It is love. You know why I say that? Because Jesus says that. He says of himself, Revelation 3.19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Brethren, if you're caught in a sin and I say nothing, that's not love. It's anything but love. We have to be willing to go to people and straighten things out so that they can be right with God, that we can be right with them, and that we can be right with God. We have to go to those who have wrongs. It is love. The whole purpose of this is to demonstrate love. And a whole attitude in dealing with those who have wronged us must be bathed in love. Our demeanor, our tone, everything else. You know what's been said? And I believe this. In marriage, about 10% of your fights, your conflicts, are about differences of opinion. 90% over the tone of voice you use when you express your difference of opinion. And I think that's, that's true. We have to be careful. We have to be very careful and show great love, compassion, and concern. Think about those who have wronged here in the, for a minute. What do you do when someone comes to you and points out a wrong that's in your life for something you have done wrong? Some way that you have offended this individual. Well, I think there are some big things we need to do. Number one, you need to repent. You need to repent. Uh, there's no ands, this, buts about it. There's no way around it. We need to repent. We have to be a people big enough to repent. That's what it means to be in Christ. Honestly, being in Christ in some ways is a lifestyle of repentance, is it not? Because we always do... Not, we often do things that are wrong. We need to repent. We need to come back to the Lord. We, that, that's a daily thing with us. 
because we're in this weak, these weak bodies. And when we have wronged other people, we must repent. Luke 13.3, the Lord says, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Paul, Acts 26.20, 20, explained his ministry. Paul declared first to those in Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. That is true with us. That's what we must do. Repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. You need to repent. Two, you need to apologize. You need to apologize. Scripture even talks about apologies in a roundabout way. Look at Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Jesus says, If you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I think there are several important principles there. One, you get these things straightened out before you worship. Worship to God could be hindered by relationships with others. One, two, it is not just that someone has something against you. You take the initiative. You've wronged the person. You don't wait for him to come to you. You go to him. You make things right. And you do it in a hurry. First be reconciled to your brother. And then come offer your gift. James 5.16 Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. I'm of the opinion that the illnesses in James 5, this is my personal opinion, but I, I believe those are not physical ailments, I, I believe they're spiritual. I, I believe that primarily because in the text it says, if you call for the elders of the church and pray for you, you with the oil, you will be healed. No, no ands, yes, or buts about it, you will be. I think that can easily apply to spiritual illness, not to physical. But think about that for a moment. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. There is no disease that compares to sin sickness. There is nothing as horrible as being caught in sin and not knowing how to get out. There is nothing more terrible than standing before the judgment seat of God, Christ on His throne, and hearing Him say, Depart from me, I never knew you. There is nothing more horrible than sin. And because of that, we have to put sin away from us. We need to repent, need to apologize, and make things right. Three, you need to be grateful. You need to be grateful. I know that sounds strange. Be grateful, be glad when someone comes and rebukes you. Yeah. Be grateful unto God. Proverbs 9, 8. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Think about those words a moment. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Why? Because a wise man doesn't want to stay in the wrong. Because a wise man wants to improve himself before the Lord. Because a wise man wants that relationship. Why should you be grateful? Think for just a moment. If someone were to come and rebuke you, all the things you'd have to be grateful for Someone loves me enough that's not going to leave me here. Someone loves me enough to come to me and want to be friends. Someone loves me enough to say, this is the will of God. Let's do it together. 
Someone loves me enough, cares enough about me to come and help me deal with this. So just leaving me where I am and allowing me to stay on a road to devil's hell. Rebuke is love. And we can never forget that. Never forget. And be grateful for what others do for us. Do you have things to make right this morning? Oh, in Matthew 18, Jesus talks about making things right with brethren and by extension right with Him. But you know, we've got to have things right with God. We have to be walking in the light as He is in the light so that the blood of Jesus can cleanse us of all sin. Is it the case this morning that you need to come to the Lord Jesus and make things right before His throne, before His cross? If you need to come this morning, which come right now as we stand singing.